Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Spring University of North Dakota Women for Philanthropy event. I'm Sarah Prout, Associate Vice President of Engagement here at the UND Alumni Association and Foundation. Women for Philanthropy brings women together to embrace philanthropy while strengthening their connections to each other and the University of North Dakota. We do that through socials, luncheons, and networking opportunities for people like you. Typically, the spring event is a luncheon, and we hope that next year we can gather together for a luncheon, hopefully. The spring event also gives us the opportunity to award our Women for Philanthropy scholarships. This year, we had an incredible 140 applicants, and two deserving UND students will each receive a $2,000 scholarship award. So without further ado, they are Olivia Taylor, a Communication Sciences and Disorders major, and Macy Marquette, a Communications and English major. Congratulations, ladies. I'd like to thank all of you who have helped to make a difference in the lives of our students like Macy and Olivia through giving through the Women for Philanthropy Fund at undalumni.org backslash women for philanthropy. Thank you. I'd also like to say thank you for today's sponsor, SEI. So as you may know, our topic today is making good happen. And I am so excited to hear from our guests today about how they are making good happen within their own com communities and the motivation behind their own philanthropic efforts. We had an overwhelming amount of questions come in for today's event, which is so exciting. It's what makes this event um, just wonderful. And so I just want to thank each and every one of you who took the time to submit a question for our guest today. Due to the overwhelming amount, we might not get to every single one of them. We will do our best, um, but don't worry. Look for communication with us in the next coming weeks as our guests answer those questions that we did not get to today. So without further ado, first up to introduce our guest is the creator of Women for Philanthropy. CEO of the UND Alumni Association and Foundation, Deanna Carlson Sink. Well, good afternoon, ladies. Let me see. Can you? Uh, are we good to go there? Okay. A little uh, hiccup there with the video starting. But welcome, and like Sarah said, thank you so much for being here. This is actually our largest Women for Philanthropy event that we have held in our history. And it's one of the benefits, we look for all those silver linings, right, during this pandemic. It's one of the benefits of virtual events. We have almost 250 individuals who have registered for today. So thank you for your interest. Yes, Women for Philanthropy was first created to bring together female leaders like yourselves to the table for some of those very important philanthropic conversations, really providing an avenue to network under the umbrella of giving back to causes that are important to each of you. As a woman in a position of foundation leadership, I have seen firsthand the importance of making sure the right people are at the table when making philanthropic plans. My goal for this event has been to enlighten more women about how to give and empower them to find their own philanthropic voice. Finding and using your voice to talk about how you would like to make an impact philanthropically is so important. Too many times, and it has happened to me personally, women are off to the side when it comes to making estate plans or philanthropic plans. I encourage you to find your voice and help others find their voice for these discussions. Like Sarah said, although we would have loved to have seen you here this spring in person, we're happy to have you here remotely. I again want to congratulate Olivia and Macy on their scholarship recipients. As, uh, we are so thankful again for all of you who have helped support that scholarship fund. And now I'm absolutely thrilled to present to you two incredibly informational, uh, informational, yes, they will be informational and inspirational female philanthropists who are also proud UND alumni, Katie Itterman and Lou Zhang. The two women have striking similarities, 
For example, they both went to law school. However, their journeys to philanthropy may be different from rural North Dakota to China. However, they both have a huge passion for supporting education. Katie Itterman is the founder and executive director of the Burgum Foundation, which focuses on supporting rural North Dakota schools with programming and student mental health. Lu Zhang is a former program manager for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She is a relentless champion for the underserved populations. So hi, Katie and Lou, so great to have you here today. Why don't we start off just by each of you telling our audience a little bit more about yourselves. So Lou, would you start us off, please? Yes, am I on mute? I hope I'm on mute. You're good, we can hear you, we're good. Ex excellent. Well, hello everybody, uh, ni hao, lei ho. My name is Lou Jiang. I am a Chinese American, first generation immigrant uh, I'm based in Seattle, Washington. I also wanna acknowledge and offer my respect to the fact that I'm currently on the traditional territory of the Duwamish tribe in Washington. So as Deanna said earlier, uh, I was a former manager at the Bill and the Gates Foundation. I work primarily in the global communication, global policy and advocacy, and US education programs. Uh, prior to joining the Bill and the Gates Foundation, I was actually a civil litigator uh, in private law practice. I litigated cases in employment law, uh, primarily focused on workplace discrimination, sexual harassment, and wage and hour law. Um, I serve on several nonprofits in the Seattle, Greater Puget Sound area. I'm currently the board member on the International Community Health Services Foundation, also known as ICHS. Uh, I'm also the co-chair for the Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders for philanthropy in the Seattle chapter. Uh, I'm also the founder of the Equal Justice Endowment at the University of North Dakota, and also I have founded the Women's Empowerment Scholarship Endowment at the Seattle Central College. Um, on my free time, I coach a high school mock trial team at the Lake Washington School District and also serve as a guest lecturer at Seattle University and Seattle Central College. So I'm very honored to be here today. Thank you so much, Lou. We're excited to have you here. And Katie, please. Um, tell the audience a little bit more about yourself. Hi, and I uh, echo what Lou said. Thank you so much for having me today, Deanna. This is such a such an incredible event, and I feel very honored to be a part of it along with uh, Lou here. I think we're really looking forward to a fun hour here discussing philanthropy and women's roles in philanthropy. I am uh, executive director of Burgum Foundation, which is a private philanthropy based in Cass County, uh, North, North Dakota, here in North Dakota. And I um, have been doing this role for about five years. We focus our giving, Deanna mentioned briefly, on rural schools, almost, almost exclusively rural schools in North Dakota. And we'll get into the details of that more. Um, you know, I was born and raised in North Dakota. In fact, I feel that I have basically been rooted to this state in one way or another for the entirety of my life, um, whether it was through work or through schooling or, you know, where I grew up in Arthur, North Dakota. I attended University of North Dakota and had a fantastic experience at UND. I think that's honestly probably where I, I've always been interested in philanthropy, but I think UND really solidified my interest in this field. And um, I am very active in addition to my professional role with Burgum Foundation. I'm on a variety of nonprofit um, or I'm involved in a variety of nonprofit organizations here in Fargo. I'm on the board of our art museum and um, an active volunteer in a lot of other ways. I stay busy with my five and two year olds in my off time and have a lot of other outdoor hobbies that I look forward to doing now that it's maybe finally warming up here shortly. Thank you, Katie. We're so excited to have you as part of our program today as well. So as Sarah mentioned, you as an audience um, were fantastic in the number of questions you submitted. So we're going to jump right in. Um, and again, Katie and Lou haven't seen these before. So this is unscripted. You're going to get their true responses on these. And what we don't get to um, we will send out to you in writing. I know there were some specific questions for Lou and some specifically for Katie and the Burgum Foundation. So we'll make sure that we get to your questions in some way. But let's start in for um, 
something kind of fun right now, I think, is what is something that you do every morning to get you motivated and excited and focused for the day? What is something that you just kind of gets you going and after you've had your Cheerios in the morning? Lou, how about you? I was going to say I eat breakfast. That's uh, <laughs> what makes me very energized uh, is to have breakfast so I'm not hungry. Um, the other thing is I would say uh, if I have time, I would try to write in a little journal about what I hope to accomplish for the day. Um, I actually got this idea from a good friend of mine, Esther Hoon, uh, an attorney with the Washington Women Lawyers Association. Um, I met her several years ago and she said, you know, Lou, I've tried this and it has helped me uh, mm -hmm. really focus and help start the day for her. So that's what I would do is if you have time, I would just say, give yourself five minutes and write in a journal about perhaps three to five things that you hope to accomplish for that day. Great, great. Katie? Well, for me, I'd say, first of all, uh, coffee. I have nice <laughs> cup of coffee for a few minutes to myself in the morning to kind of think over what it is I'm going to do. And the other thing that really energizes me is I work out most mornings early before my kids wake up. Um, home workout, like a lot of us started doing during this last year and a half. And actually, I think it works really well for me because even if it's a few minutes um, of some light physical activity, it really helps my brain to be focused for the rest of the day. That's great. And I love that, that piece about something for you. Take mm -hmm. the time. Something mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. is important. Even trying to find a little quiet time from a five and two year old. And mm -hmm. Lou, your comment about write three to five things. Don't write 30 things, right? Mm -hmm. Write three to five things that you can really get to. Um, my niece has a two-year-old daughter and she's done things like in the morning when her two-year-old together, they say, I am gorgeous. I am beautiful. I am smart. Mm -hmm. I am strong, you know, and it's, that's what gets her and her daughter going each day. Just those affirmations, as she calls them, by morning affirmations, which I think is such a cute thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so you've both talked a little bit about family. Um, Tell us what impact did your family growing up have on your philanthropic involvement? And Katie, I'll start with you this time. So I, I would honestly say, I think my family completely, completely inspired me as far as philanthropy goes. I referenced this earlier, but I grew up in Arthur, North Dakota, and it is a very small town. And, and I think that's in some ways, I, I know that Arthur lacked some activities or maybe a little more of the pizzazz of a larger city. However, that said, I wouldn't have traded it for anywhere to grow up in. I think that I was from a very young age, completely attached to my community. And I viewed all 400 people in Arthur as probably an extension of my family. We were concerned about others. We were involved in in their lives. And I think that for me, growing up where I grew up was a key factor in my interest in philanthropy. You know, other than that, Deanna, I would say watching my parents be active in philanthropy was also just a huge factor to me. And I've thought a lot about this, and I think my husband and I continue to strive to do this, but I watched my parents work at philanthropy. I didn't, I didn't have any concept at a, at a young age of what writing a check would be, but what I did understand was weeding the garden at the church or picking up litter at our park. And so I think when I take all those active, active experiences that I had, whether participating in, you know, as well as a child can participate in helping or watching people do actual work for others, that was just completely, completely a cornerstone of my, my experience. That, that's really interesting, Katie, because we do often think of philanthropy as just giving a gift, making a gift, mm -hmm. writing that check. Mm -hmm. But part of philanthropy is giving time and talents yes. as well. Absolutely. And that's really interesting. I like that term work at philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So Lou, you grow up a long ways away from Arthur, North Dakota, and <laughs> a long ways away from a city of 400 people. How did your family and those around you help, in, um, help you in your philanthropic involvement? Well, I want to just preface by saying, Deanna, that when I think about family, it's obviously it's my immediate family, but it goes beyond that. I have extended family. 
um, and also the broader kind of Asian American communities um, where I live. So I, I think a family in not only in my immediate family terms, but in a broader family sense. So my success is actually, you know, absolutely tied to the success of not only me or my immediate family, but to the broader reach of kind of the Asian American community. Um, so back to kind of my immediate family impact, I would say that my father and my grandmother were very involved in community service, uh, even back in our, our home country. Uh, I recall my grandmother would used to knit extra sweaters and scarves for uh, the neighborhood kids uh, when winter comes. Uh, where I live, it doesn't get really cold, but it does get chilly and not everybody has all the resources. So my grandmother was very much involved in doing that. And she also uh, donated extensively uh, to, I think, a fund where they supply lunch uh, for students in underserved communities. So I thought that was very kind of her. My father has always volunteered to support his community uh, by teaching. My father, uh, by profession, is a, a, a teacher. He taught English. And even after coming to America, he continued to do that as public service. He's in his mid-60s now, and to this day, he still volunteer as an ESL tutor at a local community college uh, in California where he resides. Um, to me, I think seeing my grandmother and my mother, I'm sorry, my grandmother, my father, but also seeing the impact that they have in their local community and also in their community in America after they moved here has really shaped my desire uh, to influence and be part of philanthropy and nonprofits. That is very interesting. And I think, Lou, you've hit on an, an interesting point as well that philanthropy is very generational, that it doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are, we can all be involved in philanthropy, although it may be a different in different ways. So one of the questions that came in said, how do you engage uh, Gen Z was specifically the question, how do you engage Gen Z in, in the philanthropic culture? And I may, see, may even add to that, what are the differences you see in generational philanthropy? And Lou, this time I'll start with you. Well, I think uh, the easiest way to get involved is actually just be observant. Um, my father always taught me to observe more and talk less at the very beginning. So rather than trying to tell yourself where you think uh, you should be involved, why don't you actually listen? That's what he always taught me to do. And I think to answer this question is before you start you know, diving in or rolling up your sleeve, take time to understand what issues are important to Gen Z, for example. Get brushed up on those issues, understand the perspectives before you decide to get involved. I think that's the best way I would approach um, uh, this, this matter if it's presented to me. So that's kind of how I would approach it. Is there anything else? Um, what was the second part of the question, Deanna, so, if you don't mind? Generationally, how, how can you, what have, are the differences you've seen generationally on how people are involved in philanthropy? So from your, let's go to your grandmother, to you. I think for my grandmother, personally speaking, um, it was necessity. Uh, she, grew, you know, she grew up in an era where uh, resources were not readily available. So I think her approach was wherever she can be of help to provide resource, um, increase of resource would be her method of philanthropy. I think when it gets to my father and my generation, it's more about access, right? You have these resources, but are people getting equitable access to those resources? So I think that's where the difference, just slight difference between, for example, my grandmother's generation versus my generation. Okay, excellent, excellent. Thank you, Lou. Katie, how about you? And you know, how do you engage Gen Z and what do you see as generational differences from your grandparents to you or even now to your young children? Right. Um, that's a really good question, and I, I always think about this because I think that, as you say, Deanna, every generation does have its own distinct way that they prefer to give, and I mean, and I don't want to overgeneralize because, of course, there are exceptions to every rule, but I do think that Gen Z 
really is used to having information, access to information at its fingertips. And so I think that the more transparent an organization can be, the more information that that, that organization may pump out, you know, on, on a variety of channels, whether it be Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, ways to reach um, the, the younger generation. I think that that generation will have access to information at, at a rate that, that we can only imagine. And so I think that that's one key aspect in getting those young people re really in, involved in, in nonprofits. Um, and then as far as generationally, you know, I think what Lou said is, is accurate. I think that each generation um, has a specific way that they give. I think when I look back to grandparents, I think it was incredibly localized, at least for my grandparents. It was, what could they see? What could they touch? What affected them in their small rural communities. I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily know that they gave nationally at all, to be honest. And I guess I, my, my parents could maybe correct me. I don't, I don't have that information, but my sense is that most of their giving was incredibly local. I mean, maybe within 10 miles of where they lived, right? It was very tied to geography. And I think that as generations change and, and the world becomes more global, I think that, that that's absolutely changing. And I think that there's a sense among young people that they'll support an orga organization that does work that they like. And that organization could be across the country. It could be in another, in another country. And it could certainly, you know, create change in other, on other parts of the globe. So true. You know, um, Katie, a couple of your comments that really resonate with me when I was growing up. Um, my father would write the check to the church mm -hmm. yeah. every day right, or every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And he would steal it. And I'd ask, you know, what are you giving? Well, that wasn't for me to know. <laughs> right. And so um, this communication piece, this being transparent, mm -hmm. that doesn't work today for us as individuals or as an organization, right? With, mm -hmm. with that wanting to know information. But the communication piece, the uh, Lou's point about observe more, talk mm -hmm. less. I had an opportunity to take my parents to Norway, the home country. Mm -hmm. And I had seen growing up what you saw, Katie, that they gave locally. Not till we were over there in a museum did I hear stories from my parents about as young children, they went to the church to put together care packages for the military to send overseas. Hmm. And I'm like, I would have had no idea. Right. So that communication piece, and I think that's part, you know, I opened up with saying, Finding your voice. We each have to have our voice, right? So how would you encourage people to talk more about the philanthropy that they do? Katie, you want to start with that? That's a tough one, Deanna. We're all North Dakota, or a lot of us are, you know, like you said, the Norwegian background, you definitely very humble, don't want to talk much about yourself. Yeah. I, I do think, and, and I'll tie this a little bit into the Burgum Foundation, if that is that okay to do on this question? Absolutely. Okay. So I think one of the things, I know that when this foundation um, got going, there was a feeling, at least among, you know, the, the board members who are family members that, is this the right decision? Do we want to put ourselves out there that much? Do you want to draw attention in any way to philanthropy? Because it certainly isn't about attention or about getting any name rec recognition. And I think the, one of the reasons and the prevailing wisdom that, that, that ended up sort of ruling the day, I guess that, that day when it was all sort of being talked about and decided was sometimes in order to inspire others, you have to share even a little bit about what you're, you're doing. I think it helps other people make connections. And I think it certainly helps other people determine that they too can make a difference in their local communities. And so I think that communication is so important, even though for some of us, it's harder to do than for, for others. And I think in some parts of the world, it's harder to do than in other parts of the world. And I would guess that in North Dakota, it is one of the, the places where, you know, people are not necessarily seeking attention or personal recognition, but moreover, they're trying truly to inspire others to get out there and make any, any kind of difference and, and make something better. You know, whether it's a small town park, whether it's, you know, a huge, a huge project in, in a larger city, just to get out and do something like we're talking about today, just do good. Mm -hmm. And so I think communication is, is going to continue to be more and more important. Absolutely. Lou, how about you? I agree with what uh, Katie said. I think, you know, 
talking about philanthropy, should, you should not be ashamed of that um, at all. I think if anything, you should be proud, you should be bold, um, and you should talk about it for sure. Uh, because how else are you going to be able to be transparent if you don't talk about it, right? We talked about transparency being the basis of um, trust as well as partnership building. So if you are not talking about it, then really there is no way to be transparent. So, um, and communication goes both ways, right? It's not just about you talking, but it's also about you listening um, and also summarizing, understanding, and it, it's supposed to serve as a bridge to help you understand better about either your cause or other causes that may be of interest to you. So again, I am a proponent of being transparent, being direct, and do talk about the causes that you're passionate about often. Absolutely. So I hope our guests listening today, they're going to follow your advice to, to be bold in doing good and talk about what you're doing. Let others know. It's not about lifting yourselves up. It's about lifting up who you're supporting and the projects you're supporting. So I think that's excellent. So you both are very busy women. How do you avoid that burnout and maintain a work-life balance when positions in philanthropy usually uh, revolve around what you're passionate about and you're all in and it's all hours of the day, every day of the week. So how do you take care of yourselves and maintain that balance and avoid burnout? Lou, you wanna start this time? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so first and foremost, I would say my advice, and this is the advice that I received uh, from other mentors and leaders in the field, which is, um, there may be a lot of things that you care and are passionate about, but try to focus or put together a priority list. You know, there may be 10 things that you really deeply, truly care about. However, you may only have the time and bandwidth to support perhaps two or three of those priorities um, consistently. And, and I think it's also very important to be realistic um, in assessing your own time bandwidth as well as your own well-being. Um, I think oftentimes uh, it's hard to say no, uh, but I think what I've learned through the years is understanding how to say no in a constructive way. Um, so that's what I would suggest for uh, listeners on this uh, live feed to be mindful of is to be very realistic in assessing your time, your commitments. And the other thing is I would say, as you start thinking about getting into philanthropy or doing more uh, lead nonprofits, uh, try to do uh, enter in maybe one or two before you get on to three or four. Uh, so basically start slow. Uh, you don't need to do a six, seven or eight at a time. Um, and definitely think about rotation as well. Um, that's another tip that I would uh, advice. And again, it's something that I received when I talked to my mentors, which is, you know, if there are six, seven things that you care about, let's give, your sim give yourself a time frame. Um, give yourself three years uh, to serve these two boards and then rotate to the next two and then rotate to the, the next two, so forth and so on, um, so that you do get a variety of um, experiences and you're able to learn and uh, kind of uh, aggregate some of your skills and lessons to help you become a better uh, leader in other nonprofits and fields. So those would be kind of my advice. Uh, just be realistic and be very transparent, particularly when you talk to uh, in, you know, organizations or committees uh, to which you wanna serve. I would say that's great advice. Um, and your comment earlier about be bold, you can be bold in saying no to some things too, to protect yourself. And actually it ties back to a word both of you have used. Say no is part of being transparent, you know, to protect. You wanna make sure that whoever it is that you're working with is getting your full attention. If you've got too much on your plate, that's hard to do. Katie, what would you add to that? I, Lou, I love the, the comment you made about rotation. And in fact, I'm thinking about doing a rotation in my own life here on um, in some of my personal philanthropy, and I've never thought about it in that term. So thank you for that. I think for me, I my calendar is highly organized, and that helps me immensely um, to see the week and month and, and sort of what I've committed to and what I maybe 
am too busy to, to say yes to. So that really helps me. I share a calendar. We have a family calendar, which helps with um, a variety of activities that different people in our home may or may not have. Um, I think the idea of the priority list, Lou, just it, it's exactly spot on. And I like to say it um, to myself, kind of a one in, one out, almost as if you're like you're cleaning your closet, right? You get a new pair of shoes, toss one out. I think for me, I there's a there's a, an, a nonprofit that I'm highly interested in getting involved with. And the leadership in this particular nonprofit knows that I'm highly interested, but they also know that I need to finish up um, a, you know, a board position in, in, on a current board before I can take that on. And I think that's really, really important to, I've created a connection, I've indicated interest, I've done some small volunteering, you know, getting my feet wet um, for this organization. But at this point, I know I cannot, I cannot have any sort of leadership or board role until I've finished, you know, that other commitment. Um, I think another, another thing, um, I was lucky enough to hear Kelly Steffes um, speak, who is uh, an attorney and, um, you know, private wealth advisor in Fargo. Um, she spoke a couple years ago at a Jeremiah Foundation luncheon, and she had a, a quote, and I'm going to say loose quote, because I, it's been a couple of years, so Kelly, if, I don't even know if you're listening, but um, I, I will salute and sort of what you said. She talked about a period in her life where she had to trim the fat, and mm -hmm. I've thought about that a lot, because when you look at sort of your whole holistically at your whole, you know, band, you know, all of your activities and all the things that you're committed to, what is extraneous and what can't you live without, right? And so the things that you feel so passionately about that you have to participate in, you have to volunteer with, those are the things that stay. And if you look at the other things, and th maybe those are the things that literally you're kind of trimming the fat and the things that you have to say no to, and maybe you have to say no just for right now. And it will be a yes in a year or two. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just, I think that that was, that resonated with me so much. In fact, it's been, I think, almost two years. And then finally, I think I would say, and Lou, it, what a strange year to talk about events, because I feel like right now there are hardly any, but before, you know, 2020 and the pandemic, I felt like there were always events connected to nonprofits or, uh, you know, whether it was speakers, whether it was a grantee hosting an evening event. So I got to the point where I would look at my calendar and I, I had a rule of doing maybe one to two evening events per month that were for, you know, for a work or for the foundation's purpose, just to protect that family time. And so that was a rule that I had. Now, at this point, I'm actually excited to go to any event. So <laughs> I'll, I say yes, <laughs> but um, pre-pandemic, that was kind of a rule that, that was just a rule of thumb that helped me. So that just in case that's helpful to anyone out there listening. I think the, the, there's some great pieces of advice there too. And Katie, I think it's interesting for me here at the foundation and for, I know we have um, some of my peers and colleagues on who run nonprofits, that a no doesn't mean no forever. I, I, that's what I picked up out of your comments. It doesn't mean no forever. It just means no right now in that mm -hmm. I have to prioritize some other pieces and even to be able to say, let me just dip my toes in and do a little volunteering. Yes. I, I think that's important for people in you know leadership roles, um, philanthropic leadership roles, that we remember those things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's really important. Um, I wanna circle back a little bit. Lou, when you were talking too about the advice that you had received from role models and mentors, um, it's one of the things we want to end with here is this is about finding those role models, finding those mentors. How did you find the philanthropic role model and mentor that you're referencing in your comments here, Lou? Well, first, and I, I want to preface by saying it wasn't just one role model that shaped my philosophy. It was many, actually, many role models, many mentors at different stages of my life. So they didn't all just come through right? Like at graduation, you know, they started, you know, I started getting my first mentor in high school, in college, in law school, after law school, and so forth and so on. So I am truly blessed in that sense. I'm very grateful. Um, in terms of how do you seek out role models, you have to ask. Uh, I think that's the, uh, the theme here. It's to be bold, to be transparent, and also be able to speak up for yourself and advocate for yourself. You know, for example, if you are starting out volunteering, 
at a nonprofit and you see someone is taking excellent leadership um, and taking action to tackle a particular challenge or dilemma, again, observe, right? Speak less, observe more. If you see that, why not reach out to that individual and ask to be mentored? That's actually how I did it. Um, I know that it sounds scary, but you'd be surprised how many people want to mentor uh, others or how many people want to just talk to you or just have coffee. Um, I know it's harder to do now in the pandemic, but in a way it's actually even easier because rather than going to a physical location to meet with another person, you can just schedule a Zoom meeting. So I would say, don't be shy uh, to reach out to your superheroes and say, you know, I very much admire what you did, you know, in XYZ. I would love to learn more about how you go um, tackling these challenges and what is your philosophy and what are some of your advice for someone like me who's just starting out. So that's what I did. I just, I, I just got very tough skinned and just reached out and made a call. Um, and it turned out she was amazing. Um, just the person I'm referring to is actually the CEO of ICHS Foundation, uh, Teresita Batoyola. You guys can Google her. She is a prominent national advocate of affordable health care as well as health equity. She's also recognized in 2019 as the most influential Filipina in the world. So mm -hmm. she's incredible. And I'm just so blessed to be able to work in ICHS and really um, many people like her influence who I am, and it just really requires you to be very bold to make that first move and request uh, a meeting to just yeah. chat with them. Absolutely. Great. Katie, how about you? Do you have a philanthropic role model or mentor that you look to or... I, so I, I want to say I, I have so many role models. I don't have a specific mentor. That is not something that I've had, but now Lou, you're inspiring me to get on the phone and schedule a, a zoom meeting with someone to, to be a mentor to me. Um, but I think that I've had close relationships with some women who have been just completely inspiring as far as their own individual philanthropy. And so I've just been lucky enough to get to observe them and ask, you know, ask questions and have a close enough relationship to, um, to, to really dig in and learn from the way that, you know, certain women have, have given. I think, um, you know, I can, should I go into more specifics about some of the role models? I, sure, I, sure. I, I think well, that'd be cool. so there are a couple that come to mind. I know Lou mentioned her, um, you know, father and his volunteerism early on. I think I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention my mother, Jody Burgum, as just an incredible role model um, as far as philanthropy. But what is really fun about thinking about her philanthropy is, I, Deanna, you you know her. I don't necessarily think she ever uttered the word philanthropy. I'm sure she did yeah. the whole the whole time that I was watching her and watching her work. And I think one of the things that I took away from her philanthropy was it was hands-on labor philanthropy. And I don't necessarily think that there was a community event or school event between like 1985 and 2001 at Dakota or Northern Cass that her hands didn't touch. And this was not the glamorous kind of philanthropy. That What I learned from this was sometimes there isn't a lot of glamour in philanthropy. It's just about the work. It's you know, making a meal for someone who is ill and nobody knows about that. And it's setting up chairs in the gymnasium and cleaning up and cooking food for kids, you know, at sports teams or church, church youth groups. And so I think that for me, that was just, you know, that's a, my mom is a role model that I just, you know, starting from the get-go, I learned that it was just a lot of the behind the scenes, just a lot of work. Yep. Um, you know, I think that there, there are other women that I have watched um, through the, the lens of being connected to UND that I completely, completely look up to. I think one that I'll just uh, call out is Linda Pankratz. I think her way of giving is so impressive. She is just this incredible UND alumna and so, so professionally, um, just so professionally connected. But then also in addition to her professional success, I think her way of philanthropy, from what I can observe as an outside observer, this is you know no, no pride, no in, inside information about it, just what I read and what I observe through being connected to UND, that she seems to be someone who is not afraid to offer not just her you know not just her treasure but her talent, yeah. helping organizations become so strategic and also not 
to help organizations not shy away from a challenge, but to face them head on. So I think that by watching her, you know, just holding her up to be a role model is, has been helpful to me. And then, I mean, finally, Deanna, I would, I would salute you, your ability to connect with people and inspire others is something that I often think about when I am thinking about Burgum Foundation and working in small towns in North Dakota, trying to, to, to looking to you and seeing how you inspire people. I hope that we can even do a, a small part of that in our, with our partners. And so I, I, I look up to you as well in your, what you've done with uh, the Foundation and Alumni Association. Well, thank you, Katie. That's uh, very much an honor. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna switch gears to a different question we had that came in um, early on. This one talks about people of color and minority groups and the age group as well. So how do we or can we ensure that people of color and minority groups, specifically younger people, are heard effectively? How do we utilize their suggestions for growth? And especially in philanthropy, and I'll go back to these two. I mean, there's, there's like five different, but I'll say, especially in the world of philanthropy, why aren't there more ethnic women on governing boards? So Lou, I'm gonna start with you, but let's, I'll rephrase it a little bit. How can we get more minorities and especially younger minorities involved and make sure that we're hearing their voices and utilizing suggestions and why, why aren't we finding more on governing boards? What can we do? I think there, my response to both question and also kind of the subset of each question is intentionality. You know, mm -hmm. if I am being honest and being very critical about philanthropy as a whole, we haven't been intentional about soliciting the advice and voices from youth and ethnic groups. We haven't built pipeline uh, to produce, uh, you know, women of color. We haven't been intentional about sharing power with women of color at leadership level. And what I mean about sharing power is not just hiring women of color to report to, uh, a, a, you know, an all white board. That is not what sharing of power looks like. It's about elevating, empowering women of color to be at decision-making level. That's what, it's all about intentionality. So really to respond to all three questions is mm -hmm. my critique of the philanthropy sector is we haven't been intentional. We haven't been intentional about creating the spaces. We haven't been intentional about creating a pipeline. We haven't been intentional about outreach, right? Outreach, education, um, support. We haven't been intentional about setting up mentorship programs. Um, so the crutch of the problem is we haven't been intentional. So how do we change that is to be intentional. Mm -hmm. Make that in the center of everything you do. Before you speak, before you put, you know, the first word on your proposal, before you strategize, put that intentionality in the center of all your planning. I would say that is the best way to keep yourself in check is to be intentional. That is so true. I love that term, being intentional, and then the empowering and creating a pipeline. And Lou, you are on a couple of governing boards in the Seattle area, correct? Um, or foundations out there. Are you serving in some of those roles? And if so, how did you get on? Did you have to be bold and go in, or did they come looking for you? They came looking for me. So that is an example of what happens when you too, you know, as a board, as a governing board, give yourself the mandate to be intentional about reaching out and searching, right, outreach to find women of color who has an interest and you're creating a space for them to step in. So they came looking for me and I'm very grateful that they did. Um, I was also given an opportunity uh, to learn about nonprofit leadership. Um, you know, my manager was extremely supportive, even though I'm doing all of this outside of work, you know, he approved, you know, a lot of these yeah. trainings uh, that cost some money, not a whole lot, but approve these trainings so that I can step in with a set of knowledge and experience that I may not have had to help me become a competent leader to make those decisions in my capacity um, as somebody that has leadership power at nonprofit. So again, this is, you know, intentionality on multiple 
uh, circles here, right? Not just the outreach, but the education, the support, and the encouragement. We use the word empowerment a lot, and we throw that around a lot. But the problem is to be truly to truly empower someone, you need to give time, you need to give opportunity, and you need to give them resources. It's almost like an equation. You know, empowerment equals you know time plus resource plus opportunity plus access and plus outreach. So that's how I think of empowerment. It is something that is not mutually exclusive to everything else I just said. It is integrated to the whole philosophy about intentionality. I love that. Love that. That's a good reminder for all of us, and even not even just on nonprofits, but if you are in a position of a CEO manager and somebody comes to you and wants to have this opportunity for an experience, be very intentional on having a conversation with them and helping them move forward in those ways. Katie, how about you? What would you talk about on this? Um, Lou, I agree with everything you said. And so I, I don't want to kind of, I don't want to rephrase what she said. I think though, the thing that I, I would like to just call out, and I think Lou did say this a bit, but the idea of empowering, but, but using education as a way to do so. So a lot of my work and, and the work of the foundation takes place in at the high school level, even elementary level, and in some ways, the college level too. And I think to educate, you know, women and young people of color of the opportunities that, that are out there, but then also on that, in, in that same arena, um, you know, off, empowering them to, to sort of understand that there are these positions out there and the, there are, are these opportunities. But like Lou said, you, you have to be bold and um, to, to continue to sort of educate and, and look for those voices. Absolutely, I love that, love it. So um, let's talk about your biggest win. What has been one of the biggest wins you have had in your journey so far? And what would you attribute that win to? Katie, you wanna go first this time? Sure, I'll go first. I'm. That's that's a great question. So whoever wrote that, thank you. Um, biggest win, I think. Um, last year, we so our foundation has recently, in the last three years, gotten heavily involved in mental health programming at, in rural high schools in North Dakota. And so, about eighteen months ago, um, we had two other private philanthropies hear about our program, get interested in it, and partner with us to offer mental health, you know, mental health programming in, you know, more schools. And so for me, that was such a win because I felt like even it had been, I think the foundation had been in existence by that point, three and a half years. And this whole time, you know, it was the, the question of, are we going to go public? Are we going to be a public foundation? Are we, you know, will, will we put our name out there? And I felt like finally, because we did that, I felt like we had inspired some partners to help us along the journey. And that just was such a big win for us to have that buy-in from other funders who thought like, hey, you know, this is a good program and I wanna participate. And so that win was a long time in the making, but it, it felt good. That's awesome, love it. Congratulations on that win. And Lou, how about you? What has been one of your biggest wins and what do you attribute that to? It's such a hard question because when I think about wins, there are just so many, right? Uh, it, it's hard to isolate just one and say, this is my biggest. I really don't have one that I would say trumps the other because to me, um, I see myself as a leader, but also I believe in servant leadership, right? If I do something well, it's not because of me, but it's because of a collective good. So my success is tied to your success and your success is tied to mine. So that's kind of my philosophy when I think about success and quote unquote wins. But I will say that we have made a lot of um, good effort uh, in at least with ICHS Foundation with COVID vaccine distribution and, and vaccination efforts. Um, at the very beginning, when COVID vaccine became available, there was actually, as you probably have read and heard uh, on national news, that there was a huge shortage at the very beginning. And also there was a, a huge logistic challenge. 
um, the major hiccups through the logistic chains. What happened with ICHS Foundation was that um, our clinic, so ICHS, just a quick note, is a community health uh, center that support primarily marginalized population that live around the area that they they uh, serve. And the place that I do most of my volunteering is with the International District in Seattle. So at the very beginning, we had a shortage, logistic issues, and we could have just sat there and did nothing, right? We could have just throw our hands up and say, well, we'll just wait till there's enough vaccine. But due to uh, the excellent leadership of Teresi that I just mentioned, and also a group of us, right, board members, foundation board members, clinic board members, volunteers, we all mobilized to get community buy-in, community business leaders to uh, support us, as well as setting up donation sites so that as Teresita is, you know, advocating to get more vaccine, on the other front, we were laying out, you know, schedules for volunteers. We were getting donations for masks, PPE. We have everything set up, uh, basically a fertile ground to say, so that the minute the new vaccine comes through, which we did, we were ready to go. There were no more delay. I believe that uh, the latest count was that we administer almost a million doses of vaccine uh, between January and now. So I'm, I, I think that's a great win, quote unquote win. Um, there's still a lot for us to do, but I do feel that the underlying thread to all of my success is teamwork. Uh, I didn't do it on my own. There were others that helped me, that joined me, uh, and I was part of the others uh, to be on their boat to kind of a collective, create a collective success. Boy, teamwork, that is key. And I think that was part of Katie's uh, response and her win too, was company mm -hmm. that joined you as a team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can go back to that communication and transparency. And when you tell that story, you don't know who's going to jump on with you, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's very exciting. Well, I think wins are a good place to end this very robust conversation. I wish we had more time. We've come to <laughs> our time limit on this. I can't even believe it. But I know everybody out there is giving you a round of applause, Katie and Lou, for just lending us your time, your talents today, your information, your inspiration on how we can make good things happen in our communities. And I really want to give a shout out to our sponsor for today, SCI. Man, you talk about partners. They came to us and said, what can we do to help lift up and provide information for students and alumni? And this was the one they grabbed onto and we're so thankful for them. And of course, thankful for the more than 200 people that joined us today. This is really exciting. And as you think about your journey, your philanthropic journey, I'll go back to something Sarah said at the beginning, Think about giving to that Women for Philanthropy Fund to provide scholarships for female students here on campus and to provide monetary grants for those organizations to help be transparent and communicate about the needs of philanthropy on our campus. And it helps us ensure that promising students like Macy and Olivia are able to get a college degree, which is so important. But if there are other areas you wanna to give to, that's fantastic, whether it's here, at UND, whether it's at someplace else in your community, wherever you have that interest, the most important thing you do is that you stand up, you be bold, let people know that you want to be a part of it, right? All those gifts are important. We hope to be back in person this fall and spring, as we said, so we're going to keep you updated on that. But I really hope that in this hour today, you have found your own philanthropic voice just like Katie and Lou have talked about, and that you understand what some of your philanthropic views are, and maybe they've changed a little bit. You know what? I often find that people are doing philanthropy and they don't even realize they're doing philanthropy, just like you've talked about with your families and how you watch them work. Um, I hope that you have gained confidence today in listening to these two incredible young women, um, confidence in asking questions, in talking about philanthropy, confidence to go out and find that role model and that mentor, or to be a role model or mentor for someone else. Um, do it with that intentionality, the transparency, the being bold. But above all, I'd ask all of you, 
to have compassion and show kindness to each other. We need it. Mm -hmm. Take care of each other and continue to do good in your communities. Thank you so much for being with us today. Have a great day.